Our last speaker uh, needs no introduction, a uh, new young and upcoming surgeon, Dr. Uh, Brian Jacob. Just, just Brian. Just Brian. Just Brian. Yeah. Uh, this is coming from Master Chen and Heather <laughs> to the left. Thanks for sticking around for the end. Uh, I am Brian Jacob, and it's great to see the session come together. Um, watching this grow is, is, was not planned. You know, this is an extension of who I am as a person. Uh, and those who know me, uh, not at work, know that really I'm just a connector. I like to see people uh, come together uh, and share stories and share experiences. And there was really no other intention uh, when we started this other than to keep the people that we were teaching in touch with each other as they moved forward. And it grew, and a lot of smarter people than I am uh, saw the benefits and started their own groups. And so this is just uh, one of many groups. But thank you for the opportunity to give the talk. These are my disclosures. Uh, and one of them is that I did start a for-profit company behind the scenes looking to disrupt the current publication uh, industry that's going on, and I'll talk about that at the end. Uh, but it has actually nothing to do with the uh, group that we're talking about today. Uh, I do believe that if you connect us, the doctors, uh, that you will connect your patients to better outcomes. And this really is about the patients, uh, although on the surface it's about us. We can't always bring patients into these collaboratives for obvious reasons. Uh, and you can choose your platform that fits you the best. Uh, for me, it was Facebook, uh, but for others, it's Instagram, uh, YouTube, uh, instant messaging, WhatsApp. There's so many of them out there, uh, including Twitter. And as individuals, you are all amazing. You're very su uh, smart, you, do, you read literature, you write literature, you take care of your patients, but together uh, I have found that we are much smarter than we are as individuals. In fact, I think we are beyond brilliant. Uh, and just watching the speakers today, uh, each of which who started at some point uh, in the IHC family, uh, really drives home the point that as a family we can lift each other up higher than we would have as individuals uh, in the old system. Uh, you heard from David Lurie, who, who joined our family uh, probably less than a year and a half ago, and you heard his story. He's out in California, and, and, and David, through the use of video, uh, has shown me that he's far better technically than I ever will be. Uh, his dissections uh, are second to none. Uh, I have tried to duplicate it, and I am not that good, so it is amazing to watch from him, uh, and we never would have known that without the power of this family. Uh, he adopted the platform early on, uh, but, and he showed this one video, but if you want to see an amazing uh, video, which he alluded to, go watch his lumbar hernia video, this edited video on the IHC. Uh, it's also on YouTube if you don't want to come to the group. Uh, but it's absolutely phenomenal. I still watch it every time I have a case because uh, he labeled everything and he'll, you know, give credit to Intuitive and the robot, but that's not. That's, that's Laurier at, at his best in what he does. Uh, some other surgeons in here, we've got uh, Dr. Andralis, who's our, uh, I guess, immediate uh, past president now of the AHS, but um, has done amazing things and our first female president of the AHS. And so, especially when you look also at uh, Dr. East, who, who embraced the IHC family uh, less than a year ago and is already uh, has two congresses coming up, uh, including one that we tried to do. Uh, this is an amazing platform to, for people to tell their stories uh, as they do things that we've never seen before in, in the history of medicine and are groundbreaking. And it can disseminate that message around the world globally in an instant. Uh, what do you all like to do when you're not operating, right? So uh, is you like to come to courses like this and learn, and you also like to teach. And traditionally, we've had problems with that, and you've, some of you have seen these slides before, because when we come to congresses to learn how to teach, as soon as they end, you go back to your cities, and you typically will just fall back into the routines that you were before, and you're now disconnected from the network that you had going on at the congresses. Uh, certainly, this scene is not uncommon, uh, and personally, for having the, the, the blessed gift of giving talks now for over 12 years, uh, I've gone to foreign countries where three people have been in the audience. Uh, and it's disheartening and it's a waste of time because you leave behind family and friends to do that and to give your message and to, you know, frankly, this room is also not exactly full. Um, if you look at hands-on training, which is what we used to do in different formats, the problem with that is you never really knew who you were gonna train uh, before they showed up and, and after they left, you also didn't have a relationship with those people. And again, you leave behind kids who get really unhappy that you're gone <laughs> for that. 
And so you start saying to yourself as an educator, why am I doing all this? Uh, you know, where's the return on investment? So we need mentors. And, and what I realized in my path, uh, when I was gonna quit and not even become a surgeon uh, uh, after my first years, that I was missing a mentor. And it was my mentor who actually saved me uh, in building that relationship. Uh, Andrea, Andrea. Uh, is an example of that. And she showed this in her talk, but basically uh, she embraced uh, the platform early. I think this is one of your earliest posts. It was 2016 uh, that I could find. Uh, and as she mentioned, you know, within two years, she's now this national teacher uh, of robotic tar. And, and while the family can't take credit for her, her technical skills, uh, we did connect her to a family and we embraced it, specifically Conrad, the relationship that was going on offline and behind the scenes and the encouragement that that took uh, to remind her that uh, what she is doing is good and people want to learn from it. Uh, and, and she now sees that. Uh, this hashtag M2M is, is this mentee to mentor program that we do. Uh, and so anyone who comes online who, who eventually breaks down the barriers and is willing to post their work, we will embrace, we will support you uh, and make sure that your voice is heard as well because it's not about individuals, it's about a group of us. And then this is just another example of two different surgeons from two different countries. Uh, in this example, it's Brazil and India, but they met online and, and we put them into a six week private mentorship program and now they're, they're best buds uh, and hanging out together. And this is when they first met uh, at our meeting in India. Uh, I alluded to this uh, disruptive need uh, in the publication world since 1971. It was all about publish or perish, and nothing has changed <clears throat> since then. Uh, for those not familiar, you spend a lot of time writing manuscripts and doing projects. You have to find funding for some of them. It can be very costly. You finish your conclusions. They don't always apply globally or even nationally beyond your hospital as far as the results are concerned. And then, of course, you submit your work to some uh, journal that you've chosen, there's not really any guidance on that, and then two people you've never met who you don't even know are really experts in your field are, are assigned and they call that peer review, and then what happens to 82% of submitted uh, abstracts is they get rejected. All right, so all that work, all that money, and now they're, they're rejected for some reason. Uh, so the time has come to change that. Uh, I think the, the first and the large, most recent news about this is the University of California uh, for the first time decided that they were not going to re-sign their contract with Elsevier. Uh, what many people don't realize is how much money the hospitals spend paying publishing companies for you to have access to the journals. In this case, this was an $11 million a year contract, uh, which is a lot of money for all their employees to have access to it, and they didn't re-sign it. And the main reason is because they wanted all of the articles to be open access, and they weren't. What you will typically see is something more like this. And so you go to PubMed, you click on an article, uh, and then you want to read the article, so you click on the link. Uh, but if you're not uh, part of a system, you get this. All right, so you don't have to buy the article for $40. Uh, and that's usually the roadblock for most people for getting information and getting access. And so uh, with that as a problem, I do think that if we can create a network that's connected where we're not just connected to each other, but we're also connected to the literature, uh, suddenly you'll have true open access, not just to the papers, but to, to the physicians who wrote them and the physicians who are reading them. Uh, so for example, and, and Igor's not in the room right now, but you know, so Igor will, will make this amazing video about the anatomy specific to abdominal wall reconstruction and post it. Uh, and we can now go in uh, and watch this video uh, and at the same time be able to have a discussion with him. Uh, you can watch a video and then immediately go back in and ask uh, Igor a question. And so that's very different than reading literature where you're, you're sort of stuck reading a conclusion uh, and then there's no avenue for you to have a dialogue uh, with your colleagues or with the actual author about it. And so here you can go right back and you can see in the bottom here that I'm actually gonna type a, a, a question where I can tag Igor uh, and then I can say, you know, please specifically show us the conjoint tenon which he left out uh, and then he can respond to it. Uh, in addition, you may disagree uh, with what you're reading in the literature and the ability to have three different opinions and have them debated out and to achieve some sort of consensus is really important, especially when it comes to the adoption of robotics for the smaller hernias as we're moving, uh, or even the larger ones that you saw earlier in the day. Uh, I think one of the main things that these platforms have helped people do is in operative planning. 
Uh, we see a tremendous amount of images come up, uh, specifically CAT scans and MRIs, and uh, we are planning these surgeries together. Uh, and sometimes it's not what surgery to do, but even what surgery not to do. Uh, and so through consensus, I think these patients are definitely getting uh, a better deal. And if you're not good at CAT scans, we have Eric Pauli, uh, who is amazing at reading CAT scans, and he is always available 24-7 uh, in this group and also in our premium group uh, to help you read your CAT scan. And he'll find hernias that six radiologists have missed. So it's pretty phenomenal. Uh, but he is a, an excellent resource. Uh, I think we are all better uh, through the power of, of what's called reactions, so the thumbs up and the, the smiley faces and the emojis. Uh, as non-scientific as that may sound, the med students that we're training today are going to be very used to communicating through emojis and through gaming. Uh, they're going to be very used to communicating on their phones, and they're going to need platforms that do that. And to try to take the next generation of surgeons and put them into what we had to learn with is a mistake. And so we need to be uh, able to adopt to that. Uh, so currently today in our platform, we have 7,200 members. Uh, that We have a wait list uh, that needs to be vetted of over 840 surgeons still waiting to get in who have applied. Uh, we are seeing over 200 new posts every single month. That's 6,521 comments every month. Uh, in general, that's 15,000 case reports that have been uploaded to the system since we started in 2012. Uh, what I think is the coolest part is that we are, are clearly now approaching the 100 country mark. Uh, and so we see countries uh, who don't have access to our congresses or even to the literature and we're reaching them. Uh, India is, is a great example of a second one where they've started their own. So I think in the future it's about posting or perishing. Uh, I, I don't think that you necessarily have to write a manuscript anymore. I do think you have to upload your stuff. And what we're doing with the IHC now is we're taking it on the road. We're taking it to countries that can't normally come to our congresses. And so we did a couple in New York, uh, but then we've been to Argentina to, to do a congress. We've been to um, India. And then Talar is uh, our director, and she's going to run a congress in July in Armenia, uh, which is going to be amazing. Uh, and then in 2020, we're going back to India to Mumbai. So we're now able to take our congresses and go on the road with it. So I'm stuck. Someone quick log into Facebook. Is this really? Uh, what the future looks like, and I say yes, uh, and I know that Facebook believes me because we have meetings every month about it, and I know that Conrad definitely says yes. Uh, there's another uh, surgeon who's embraced us and is in there all the time. Uh, I think some of the other things that the platform does are, are pretty self-explanatory for those left in this room. What I do want to say, because I don't want to leave out all these other amazing groups, and I always rush through this slide, but uh, I always say that a candle uh, doesn't lose anything by lighting another candle. And so to watch other surgeons start their own groups that have thrived in their own right is amazing, specifically uh, the Robotic Surgery Collaboration, the International Bariatric Club, uh, the pediatric ones. Uh, there's, there's a bunch out there at the Sword Journal Club, and they themselves have this many people collaborating. And you add up all these numbers of the surgeons that are online, that's pretty fantastic. Uh, Sages believed in, in the concept, and they've allowed me to start eight Sages-specific groups, uh, which has allowed me to take 16 new uh, admins and give them a platform to tell their story. So it's really amazing to watch uh, all this growth uh, move on, uh, specifically because there's a lot of stories to tell and a lot of ways to get out there. Uh, we have work to do. Uh, there's some medical legal stuff, and we, I'm giving a talk this afternoon on, on where that's gone. Uh, people don't want to waste their time, and so we've figured out ways to offer CME credit for the hours that you spend in these groups, and we've published about that as well. Uh, and I'll conclude by just saying I am firmly convinced that if we connect all of us, we will connect our patients uh, to better outcomes. Uh, we don't always agree, but we can agree to disagree, and we do that online, and then we come out and we have each other a beer afterward. So thanks again. It was a privilege to be here.